30 more seconds. All right, welcome, welcome today to our uh, CBIDS digital um, webinar, uh, digital mental health webinar, which is supported um, in collaboration by the Society for Digital Mental Health. Um, we're thrilled to have uh, Dr. Jessica Slider here today, um, who's gonna be giving us a wonderful presentation of her uh, body of work. This is really exciting for me. I've um, known Jessica for a bit of time now and um, is a pal and colleague through the Implementation Research Institute. And I'm just thrilled to hear um, her presentation, but also wanna share some of her amazing Accolades. So she's assistant professor um, in the Department of Psychology um, and Clinical Psychology at Stony Brook University. Um, also is a faculty affili affiliate of the Allen Ada Institute, uh, or excuse me, Center, um, and is a consultant to the World's Bank. Um, she has won many awards and lots of um, research grants for her work, which you'll hear about her amazing um, uh, research today um, and has been featured in the Wall Street Journal, the Atlantic, Vox, and in 2020 was chosen um, as one of Forbes 30 under 30 in healthcare. So congrats on that um, major achievement. Um, has published lots of papers and um, books, but particularly I want to um, mention she has a forthcoming um, nonfiction book called Little Treatment's Big Effects, which maybe we'll be hearing a bit of precursor about today. So um, with that, I'll turn it over to Jessica. Please um, use the Q&A feature or uh, put it in the chat and I'll help uh, facilitate that. Um, they'll have time at the end for questions as well, but if there's anything clarifying, um, you know, Jessica, let me know if that should change, but feel free to let us know and um, we'll help monitor. Um, with that, take it away. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to have the obligatory awkward pause while I share my screen. Hold on just a second. Okay, hopefully you're seeing the right thing. Looks great. Anything? Okay, awesome. Well, I'm so excited to be sharing um, the past, a, a very brief synopsis of the past four uh, years of work that the Lab for Scalable Mental Health has been doing. Um, and I'll look forward to answering any and all questions you have about these topics, both after the talk and hopefully even beyond that. I'm a CBT trained therapist. I'm obliged to start with an agenda. I'm first going to talk a little bit about why I believe that brief and scalable interventions are essential and central to the future of mental health care, how our lab goes about building and testing scalable and particularly single session interventions for young people and their parents, and what we're doing now and next, both in the near and further future, to implement our programs and identify best uses to make these sustainably available as part of the mental health care ecosystem. There has been a whole lot of progress in the identification of effective youth mental health interventions. And at the same time, we have an extraordinarily long way to go before meeting the needs of youth and families across the country. In the United States, the statistic has stayed depressingly consistent for a, a while now. Um, of the young people who need uh, with significant mental health needs, about 20% will access any form of specialty treatment whatsoever. Of that 20%, about one in five will receive what we would consider in our field to be a full course of psychotherapy. And what I mean by that, um, just to unpack it a little bit further, meta-analytic evidence suggests that on average, evidence-based psychotherapies for young people mental health last about 12 to 16 sessions. Um, at least that's how they're designed. However, national insurance reimbursement data tells us that the mean number of sessions actually attended by youth mental health treatment seekers is 3.9. And in the US, in Australia, in Canada, and in multiple other countries, the UK, the modal number of sessions actually attended in mental health settings happens to be one. And that applies both to face-to-face -to -face teletherapy and digital self-guided interventions, which are often downloaded, used once, and never touched again. One popular uh, suggestion or path forward um, in uh, re reducing this huge disparity in access is to increase the number of trained providers that are available. Unfortunately, this wouldn't quite do it <laughs> because the provider shortages, at least in the US, are simply too severe and too chronic um, for access problems to be solved via workforce uh, training below. Uh, and so the areas in blue on this map, which I generated with publicly available data from HRSA, uh, show the federally designated mental health care provider shortage areas in the U.S. as of this year. Um, shortage areas are in blue. The whole map is blue. Not an error, simply the state and the extremity of the situation. 
On top of the shortage of providers and the limited access to care, even our best gold standard treatments, cognitive behavioral therapy, et cetera, don't always help. And in fact, psychotherapies for young people have not grown stronger in 50 years. Um, these sad graphs are um, trends showing the on average effect sizes of youth psychotherapies uh, in randomized controlled trials compared to um, active controls or uh, no treatment controls in a meta-analysis conducted by John Weiss and colleagues with over 400 uh, trials in it. You can see that that effect size for depression has actually gotten smaller over time. So we are not making much progress with the status quo approach to things. On top of the provider shortages and the lack of treatment potency in some cases, existing treatments aren't actually built to match youth needs in particular, uh, which center around convenience, autonomy, and flexibility. Existing mental health supports for young people simply aren't located where youth look for support, which increasingly is online. Youth are actively disempowered by our healthcare system to access care independently. Parents are gatekeepers to every step of mental health treatment that youth and particularly adolescents are able to access. When we conduct mixed methods research, um, including teens experiencing depression who had trouble accessing mental health support, 32% uh, of teens we've talked to out of hundreds at this point who couldn't access care cite parents as the primary barrier to accessing mental health treatment when they needed it. Treatments also don't fit how youth want to engage with support, which is briefly as needed when the perceived need arises, not continually once a week, sort of for an indefinite period of time. So I hope we're now all on the same page in terms of the clear need for accessible, well-targeted supports that can empower young people to access care where and how they want it, can augment effects of interventions we already know can do something, and can offer something ideally with scientific support to those who would otherwise access nothing at all. And that is where I'm really hopeful that our lab can come in and fill some of these gaps. Our aims are three interconnected pillars. The first is to actually develop, uh, largely focusing on co-design methods, brief scalable interventions for mental health problems, um, emphasizing young people, but also increasingly lifespan to identify how those uh, brief interventions might work and how to get them to people who might be well positioned to benefit the most and how to get them out to where people actually are, dissemination and implementation beyond brick and mortar clinics. I wanna pause here because single session interventions is a term that still many people have not heard before. As a graduate student in clinical psychology, I'd never heard this term outside of my own research or in my clinical training. So what are SSIs exactly? Um, so our team has come to define them as specific structured programs that intentionally, and that is key, involve one visit or encounter with a clinic provider or program. These can be a digital self-guided program, a teletherapy delivered program, or a face-to-face -face program. SSIs may be accessed on one occasion or on many occasions. That is, they're delivered in a one-at-a-time approach, not a one-and-done approach. Somebody may perceive a need for an SSI at multiple moments, they're still designed to be SSIs. Because regardless of how they're delivered, SSIs drop the often false assumption that people are going to return for more treatments. And they're designed to instill the belief that meaningful change is possible at any moment, even brief ones. Um, and this really turns on its head how many psychotherapists are trained to deliver care, um, creating the expectancy not only in clients, but in clinicians and providers that change is in fact possible in brief periods of time, often involves a paradigm shift uh, in terms of how folks approach care in general. Decades of research show us that SSIs can help in some but not all cases as much as longer term interventions. This is a graph pulled from a meta analysis of 50 randomized controlled trials of SSIs that I led back in 2017. At that point, there were already 50 RCTs on youth focused SSIs. The red bars in this graph show the average effects of mental health treatments that are full length, so 12 to 16 sessions um, in reducing anxiety, behavior problems, and depression for young people. The blue bars are the average effects that single session interventions had on anxiety, conduct, and depression in young people. Those effect sizes are strikingly similar. My advisor then and I puzzled over these uh, <laughs> non-differences quite a bit. Um, but ultimately, um, I've come to view this in a glass half full approach in that there really seems to be something tappable that we haven't fully understood. 
um, about single session interventions that can be harnessed to improve mental health. And I want to emphasize that single session interventions cannot and should never replace other forms of mental health treatment in terms of what's available to people, right? Multiple, like a, a diversification of mental health supports in the broader ecosystem is necessary. Alan Kasdan has written extensively about this. What I do think is that SSIs can bridge otherwise unfillable gaps in ecosystems of care that we simply haven't been able to full, uh, fill with the status quo. Our team asks multiple questions in thinking about how to scale up single session interventions on, in a sustainable way. First, we try to figure out what should they target? You know, you only have one session. There are lots of things they could do. What exactly should we focus on? We focus on trying our best to modify within person beliefs or behaviors that are modifiable um, as demonstrated in research. Um, that can either identify uh, or target short-term mechanisms like hopelessness or perceived agency in young people, accommodation of anxiety in parents of anxious kids, internalized stigma in LGBTQ teens, or specific symptoms that are part of larger multifarious disorders like depression, so just focusing on withdrawal from activities or just focusing on self-hate. And the idea being that targeting these proximal um, outcomes can spur upward spirals of long-term change because these proximal targets are linked with broader forms of psychopathology. How should SSIs be delivered? We think in multiple ways, either as standalone barrier-free supports uh, for those without access to any care whatsoever. Uh, so that can be as a self-guided intervention, a free of charge website or SSIs embedded into social media. I'll talk about both of those later or provider-delivered SSIs, as in a drop-in clinic um, that offers one-at-a-time single sessions, which I'll also talk about momentarily, or as adjuncts or complements to longer-term care for those already in systems, for that lucky 20% of kids who've interfaced with treatment, right? That could be self-guided, again, either maybe to complement primary care depression screening, so to give some, something to someone automatically if they screen elevated on symptoms, to increase uptake of uh, crisis resources and we have examples of that too. Or provider-delivered interventions for folks on waiting lists, which is now standard practice. I'm happy to report at Stony Brook outpatient uh, mental health facilities. Finally, we ask who benefits most from single session interventions? Who should we target dissemination to? Um, we don't know. <laughs> um, all of our guesses have been incorrect, um, including but not limited to uh, folks with more severe symptoms. Um, we thought they would might benefit less from brief light touch interventions. That does not seem to be the case. In fact, folks with more severe symptoms tend to seek out and complete SSIs at higher rates. Um, we've looked into gender, sexual orientation, um, uh, race, ethnicity, a bunch of demographic and sociodemographic variables, contextual variables, nothing really seems to predict very consistently. So that's led us to ask, you know, at what point should we prioritize targeted dissemination of SSIs, as in focusing on specific pathways to getting these treatments to as many people as possible over treatment matching of these interventions, trying to figure out which SSI for whom. I don't know the answer to that, by the way, but I'd love to discuss it. So to try our best to unpack answers to these questions, we run large scale clinical trials of our brief interventions in diverse context, populations and settings. These are five of the interventions we've developed and evaluated in a number of RCTs and open trials. I'm going to touch on all of them today, but where I want to start is with some of our um, uh, adolescent depression focused interventions. That's where I started all of this work and sort of got into the SSI space initially. And I think this study nicely exemplifies our overall approach to testing out and building these interventions. So there are two types of SSIs that have shown promise for youth depression. One is a growth mindset intervention, an intervention that we call project personality. It's 30 minutes or 20 to 30 minutes, completely self-guided. And it is designed to target hope and malleability beliefs by teaching people how and why symptoms of depression and anxiety and the way people act are inherently malleable because of neuroplasticity rather than set in stone, which is often a feeling that folks with depression can feel like things will never change for them. In multiple RCTs with clinical and community samples, um, we found that this intervention can significantly reduce depressive symptoms from four to nine month follow-up periods compared to active controls. Additional research suggests that a single session intervention targeting, which won't surprise many people, behavioral activation can be helpful for reducing depressive symptoms. This work started in uh, college uh, university counseling centers and showed that um, provider delivered SSI teaching BA could actually reduce depression substantially. 
And since that work has been expanded to young people, younger teens um, with depression symptoms and show that they're acceptable, can improve hopelessness, improve self-hate, uh, and a bunch of other outcomes linked to depression. So when COVID-19 first hit, my team came together and we tried to brainstorm as much as we could about how we could you know, potentially be helpful in this moment, given that our SSIs are it's specifically designed to serve folks who don't have access to care. And at that point in history, that was most people who were losing access to even the supports they had previously. So we applied for an NIH um, competitive revision award associated with my early independence award from NIH, and we're lucky to receive it to conduct the first nationwide trial of SSIs for youth mental health. So we got to test whether Project Personality or the ABC project could help reduce depression compared to an active control in high symptom teens from all 50 states across the country. Our uh, results have already been published in Nature Human Behavior. Um, it was uh, finalized earlier this year. There are preprint data and pre are all available if you'd like to take a look. And if you think of other questions that emerge from these data, because our data are public, you can actually follow up and explore them yourself. So please keep that in mind. Um, our data are there for that reason. So who was in this study? We recruited 2,452 adolescents, ages 13 to 16. All of them were recruited directly via Instagram from all 50 US states. How did we do that? <laughs> well, we obtained an IRB waiver for parent consent. Um, this took a while and um, many thanks and shout outs to uh, often collaborator of our lab, Catherine Fox, um, who's an expert in this area. Um, and this allowed us to ensure that our minimal risk mental health supports were available to anyone who needed them, regardless of the feasibility of, of involving parents in the process. Um, and that's, again, based on this mixed methods work that we've done, um, where teens view parents as a really key access barrier to treatments. 87% of folks in the study met clinical cutoffs for depression. Um, the inclusion criteria was elevated symptoms subclinically or greater. Most were female in terms of their sex assigned at birth, but there was quite a bit of gender diversity in the sample. Interestingly, 80% of youth were LGBTQ in this study, 20% gender diverse youth, and half uh, identified as racial or ethnic minority populations. We believe, um, although this was not an RCT, right, that the waiver of parent consent allowed us to reach kids who are chronically and historically underserved by the mental health system, namely LGBTQ uh, youth and um, racial and ethnic minoritized youth, which was really exciting to see. On the left, you can see an ad. Um, this was one of our Instagram ads that kids could click on, go to the ascent form and start the study. Um, and on the right, you can see a map of everyone in our study. And this is just a map that I like. So I wanted to share it with you. I'm very proud of it and excited by it um, to see the reach of this kind of support. Um, our lab coordinators, who are amazing, also made a video tutorial on our entire recruitment approach. So if you want to replicate or approximate what we did, um, they uh, created a step-by-step -step guide for you to do just that. Um, so, of course, because we had um, waivers of parental permission requirements, we were very thoughtful about our approach to youth safety. We created a six-page mental health support list, which listed resources that teens could use with or without parent involvement. Um, we offered any teens who endorsed self-injurious thoughts or behavior with a self-guided safety planning tool. So when the study was done, they were automatically offered the chance to create a safety plan. They also had the option to request outreach from our team if they felt unsafe or they needed help navigating resources. Only about 2% of teens took us up on this, um, but still it was, it was um, important to have the option. So after uh, qualifying for the study based on a, a brief screener that was you know, part of the survey they, they clicked on in Instagram, uh, kids did a baseline assessment. Some pre-intervention questionnaires were then randomized by uh, Qualtrics survey to one of three conditions, project personality, ABC project, or our placebo control, which I'll get into. We then looked at immediate post-intervention outcomes because some of our past work has found that immediate shifts in pre to post levels of hopelessness or agency actually predicts the magnitude of longer term changes in things like depression and anxiety. So those immediate changes can actually serve as markers for potential longer term change, so they really matter. Then we follow it up, 72% um, of the sample um, uh, stayed in the study at three month follow up and looked at longer term effects on symptoms. Now I wanna share a little bit about our overall approach, which applies to all of the uh, digital SSIs that we've developed. 
um, that guides how we go about building these things. And this is called the best elements of SSIs for youth mental health. We use brain science or increasingly any sort of science, brain or not, to normalize the concepts we're teaching and strengthen buy-in. That way, we're not just anonymous adults telling teens or users exactly how they should cope, but we're providing them with scientific facts that allow them to draw their own conclusions about whether and how these skills might work for them. We empower users to the helper or the expert role um, rather than the sort of passive patient role that they may be used to in care. We include saying is believing exercises, essentially opportunities to give advice to peers based on what they just learned in their own lived experience to solidify learning and further empower users to learn that their voice matters. And we have lots of stories and testimonials from valued others because tons of market research, psychology research tells us that stories really are great ways of relaying information in a memorable and impactful way. So these are just screenshots of how the interventions open. Project personality, growth mindset intervention on the left, ABC project, behavioral activation on the right. We frame the programs as requests for teens help. So we say, we need your help, not you need our help. <laughs> uh, we say that we're scientists from Stony Brook University. We study the brain or personality or, or depression or how teens cope with stress. Uh, and we think we have these scientific concepts that could be helpful to other teens who are struggling. Um, and we'd love your perspective to help these ideas resonate with other people who've lived what you've lived. Uh, so your lived experience matters here. So we need your help to really convey this information. And I'll show you later on in the talk exactly how we use Teams feedback to provide and create resources to feed forward to support their peers. We include brief neuroplasticity or brain-based sort of scientific lessons in the programs. Um, in project personality, we explain neuroplasticity and how that means that change is possible even if it feels like it's not. Um, in the ABC project, we explained that the brain has a built-in must-avoid response when it detects danger or potential threat. And sometimes that can go a little bit overboard um, and we end up avoiding things and getting into a habit of avoiding things when it's not actually helpful to us. So we can help our brain undo that accidental overdrive of the must avoid response by practicing. They hear and have opportunities to read narratives and personal stories of how teens have actually used these ideas to cope with distress. Uh, we've updated and iterated on these over the years um, in partnership with participants in our research. The, the, the ABC project also includes a built-in behavioral experiment and personalized action plan. Um, teens are first asked to rate their mood, zero to 10 scale, worst to best mood possible. They then get the choice of one of three very well-tested, wonderful, hilarious videos. This one is the world's cutest porcupine eats a pumpkin. It makes the best noises I've ever heard in my life. Um, it's wonderful. And then we ask for their mood rating again, right after that. If it's gone up even one point, they get the feedback that, wow, in 30 seconds, you did something and your mood changed a little bit. Imagine if you engaged in values aligned activities, things that are meaningful to you personally, every day for one minute or even two, how much of a difference that could make. And by the end of the program, they've built a personalized plan for engaging in values aligned behaviors, including spending time with people who make them feel good, achieving a goal, enjoying something just for themselves, um, who they can ask for help in doing these things and how they can be a good friend to yourself when doing those things is inevitably hard. Finally, we have these saying is believing activities um, where youth get to be the experts um, in how to cope and the teachers really. So we ask, you know, based on what you learned in this intervention, what would you tell someone else who is struggling? Um, I'll just read out one of these because I really love it. Um, one teen wrote, in Project Personality, I would tell them to remember that even though it feels like these things will never end, nothing is forever. Maybe by being nice to the kid, you can make him realize that he's being mean and his neurons will help him change for the better. That was in response to try to help somebody else cope with um, a, a peer rejection scenario. So what did we compare our SSIs to, our control group? The most realistic control that we possibly could have chosen would be nothing. But we wanted to make sure that going through these interventions wasn't just the effect of anything, um, but rather the effect of the specific format and content of the interventions that mattered for, for mental health outcomes. So for my dissertation project years ago, I actually created a placebo digital self-guided single session intervention called the Sharing Feelings Project. This is designed explicitly to control for non-specific aspects of doing an online self-guided single session intervention. Um, 
and it aims to normalize kids to share their feelings with close others. It was designed to reflect or approximate the kind of advice that kids would often receive in terms of coping with their mental health. So it's face valid. It doesn't give away the intervention condition. Kids are actually quite bad at guessing whether this is the active condition or not, because to them, it really does feel like what they associate with therapy. There's no mention of malleability of personal traits and no action plan in this program, and there's no opportunity to give advice to others, but they are matched uh, by length and in terms of number of interactivity points like writing exercises. So what did we find? First, going back, we looked at immediate outcomes because, as I mentioned, those can predict the magnitude of longer term outcomes on symptoms. Both SSIs compared to the placebo control significantly reduced hopelessness from pre to post intervention and significantly improved perceived agency or perceived control from pre to post intervention. With our primary outcome, depression, we found that again, both interventions outperformed the placebo at three month follow up in terms of changes in depression symptoms over time with a small effect. But given that this was an active control and a very large sample size, we were delighted to see this. We also found that project personality, but not the ABC project, significantly reduced anxiety symptoms at three-month follow-up compared to the active control. And um, both interventions, to our surprise, ended up significantly reducing past-month restrictive eating uh, compared to the control, which was without trying, unfortunately, present in 60% of our sample at baseline. So this was all very exciting to see. Of course, we wanted to know if these effects were equitably uh, observed across youth, you know, who would or normally otherwise not get care. Um, wonderful grad student in our lab, Riley McDaniel, um, did a very exciting study recently and found that SSI effects did not differ by race, ethnicity, gender identity, or sexual orientation. And because of the representativeness and the diversity of our sample and its size, we were actually able to look at each group individually on all outcomes of interest um, for this study. So we were really excited to see that we were equitably serving folks uh, with differential historical access to treatment. So that summarizes our overall approach that we've used over the past few years to building and evaluating teen-focused depression interventions and SSIs more broadly. I want to shift now to some of our representative work with parents. Um, and I know that I just got through saying that uh, parents are primary gatekeepers and teens should be able to access things on their own. Um, and at the same time, while that is true, Parents are also really important to engaging, especially younger kids in treatment. Parents are also in ideal positions to deliver evidence-based practices that we know can promote child mental health. So we drew on a little bit of work for this project from um, research coming out of the um, Child Study Center at, at Yale um, that's been led by Ellie Leibowitz and Wendy Silverman, showing that a parent-directed intervention, teaching parents to promote bravery and approach behaviors in their kids and reduce accommodation of anxiety, can actually in perform non-inferior um, to exposure therapy in reducing child anxiety symptoms and disorders. This is remarkable because, you know, exposure therapy has been the gold standard um, primary focus treatment for youth anxiety for a very long time. Um, and our team, specifically Jenna Sung and Emma Mumper, two wonderful grad students, um, were interested in seeing whether we could do that in one session, <laughs> or at least some portion of it. So Project Empower was born. Emma, Emma's favorite animal was a hedgehog, so Empower is forever uh, marked by a cute hedgehog. So Project Empower, we wanted to see in a sample of 301 parents of children ages 4 to 10, all of whom had elevated anxiety themselves because anxiety runs in families. Did they find Empower acceptable? Did they actually report reductions in accommodation of their children's anxiety and, and avoidance? And did they did Empower improve parent distress tolerance compared to an information-only control? Why distress tolerance? Well, because when parents see their kids in distress, uh, like when they're anxious and trying to not go to school, for example, um, they get distressed. Of course they do. They're wired that way. <laughs> um, and so parents' ability to tolerate that distress is a key factor in whether or not and to what degree they will accommodate their child's anxiety. So an intervention like this has to move both distress tolerance and accommodation. 
You'll recognize a screenshot from the first slide of this intervention. Uh, again, we use the best principles to guide all of our self-guided SSIs. So we tell parents that we are um, you know, very, very grateful for their involvement and help in creating resources for other parents um, who are learning how to support their uh, anxious kids through difficulties and challenges. The goal of the program is to help parents uh, create a plan to identify situations that trigger your child's avoidance instinct, to empathize with your child's instinct to avoid and understand that from their perspective, it does make sense. It's coming from somewhere real and encourage their child to approach those situations anyway when they're not actually dangerous because you know that they can do it. And our goal is to give parents the skills they need to spot their child's avoidance patterns in the face of challenges and model adaptive approach-oriented coping to help them cope with future stressors. In the intervention, we explain to parents how and why parents become distressed when youth express and experience anxiety um, and how to reinterpret those moments of distress as opportunities to model healthy coping for their kids. And we also, based on parent feedback, differentiate between accommodation and attentive parenting, um, largely because many parents um, feel as though accommodation, in fact, is being an attentive parent. Um, so that distinction is important to drive home. What did we find? We found that Project Empower was highly acceptable to parents. Parents thought it would be likely to help others. They agreed with the message. They found it easy to use. They would recommend it to others. 85% of parents who completed Project Empower said they felt a little or a lot more prepared to help their child manage distress compared to about 20% in the information only control. We also saw that Project Empower significantly reduced parent accommodation of child anxiety over two weeks versus the information only control and significantly improved parent distress tolerance over two weeks versus the information only control with moderate effect sizes. Um, just to unpack the control condition, that was links to gold standard evidence-based information online via APA, clinical child and, and uh, adolescent psychology uh, society, um, resources that many, many experts have built over the years. Um, so again, we're seeing that our delivery system of relaying this information in SSI format seems to have the effects that we hope the treatment would have, and ideally that we hope that providing this information would have. I'm really happy about this more recent partnership over the past couple of years with Jiller and Reichmay at University of Miami to translate and adapt Empower for Haitian Creole and Spanish speaking caregivers based on wonderful mixed methods work they've been leading in Miami. Uh, and we're really happy that Empower is now publicly available in all of those languages. So backing up to move forward. Since the lab's launch in 2018, our evidence-based SSIs have served at least um, 30,000 teens, young adults, and parents. That's more than 7,000 via our grant-funded clinical trials and at least 23,000, likely more at this point because this was estimated in September by a nonprofit and community partnerships. And as of this month, our SSIs are available in five different languages thanks to collaborations with folks uh, across the world. All of our interventions are free that I've talked about and that I will talk about, and all of our de-identified data are public. Um, our interventions are free because uh, we believe that these should not be gatekept um, and that the sort of um, gatekeeping of mental health materials that work, especially in the digital space, has really uh, fragmented dissemination efforts, and we're hoping to be able to change that and create new norms around it. Our de-identified data are public because if we're to create a cumulative science that can reliably identify what works, it has to be. <laughs> um, so that's why I encourage anyone, if you have follow-up questions about our research, you can answer them. All our, all our data are available. So please do. You can uh, feel free to let me know if you do, but you certainly don't have to. It's all an open science framework. So in terms of scaling up our SSIs, our strategies have been many, and they've spanned more than 20 trials in the past four years. It's much easier to do many iterative trials when your single session, when your interventions are only one session. But this is a sampling of the approaches we've used to try to disseminate and implement at scale. I'm not going to talk about every single one. Um, I'd be happy to talk about any of them with anybody, but I want to give you a sense of some of our efforts in a little bit more of a concrete way. So up oh, my room thinks that I'm gone. Okay. <laughs> so this is actually the first uh, time I'm able to share this data, but um, we've had a 
an ongoing study for a few years involving linking primary care screening with SSI dissemination. This is actually something we wrote up as a registered report, um, meaning we got the methods and protocol accepted um, and uh, the journal agreed to publish our future results regardless of what we found because of the rigor of our methods. Um, to see if online youth and parent directed single session interventions could increase mental health service access and reduce youth depression when paired with routine primary care based depression screening. Lots of pediatric primary care clinics screen for youth depression, but what they do after that varies markedly. <laughs> um, often when kids screen elevated on depression, their family receives a, a sheet with many referrals for the family to call. Unfortunately, because of the you know, dearth of mental health availability, most of those resources don't go anywhere. Providers don't have room in their um, caseloads or the wait is six months long. So we wanted to see if immediate free interventions, both for youth and for parents, could increase both follow through and treatment seeking, which is the goal here, um, and also reduce depression. These are interim results. Our ultimate goal for our sample is about 250. We have um, results with fun, the first 147 families who've taken part. First of all, we found that the percent of families who contacted a mental health provider within three months after receiving um, our interventions compared to just receiving that handout that I talked about, information, psychoeducation, and referral, um, they were significantly more likely if they got their S if our, our SSIs to actually contact a mental health provider. Additionally, and I wasn't sure if this would work because so many people have, you know, an overabundance of clients. Um, folks who got our SSIs compared to those who did not after screening were significantly more likely to actually book a mental health appointment for their child within three months. So these are really exciting interim steps. Of course, we need to see if they hold in the larger sample, but I'm excited to explore additional ways to implement things like this in routine primary, uh, primary care settings, which really wouldn't add many costs, but could, as we can see, you know, uh, move the needle a little bit on making contact with the support we know some families need. Um, especially, you know, seeing that percent of folks who actually made an appointment go from 28% to almost 50 was really encouraging. We also aim to disseminate our SSIs through free anonymous online tools. Um, this is a screenshot from our publicly available website, Project Yes, Youth Empowerment and Support, which is an ongoing program evaluation project that allows anyone, anywhere, anytime to access our evidence-based SSIs. Uh, from wherever they are anonymously. Project Yes has three steps to any user. First, users are empowered to choose one of three activities, depending on which one seems most relevant to what they're experiencing. We ask pre and post questions about their levels of hopelessness, self-hate, agency, perceived control, what they thought of the intervention. So we get a lot of great qualitative feedback through Project Yes. And we also ask users to share their best advice for others who may be struggling and see it posted on this page for others to learn from. So in our advice center on Project Yes, we actually have dozens, if not hundreds at this point, um, of pieces of advice from teens who've used Project Yes in the past. The reason that's only dozens or hundreds is not because that's how many users we've had. In fact, we've had thousands, um, but it's because we have to manually go through every single piece of advice to make 100% sure that it is something that should go in the advice center. We run a number of open trials at this point on Project Yes, um, because it's anonymous information, we can't follow up with folks, so it's just pre-post. We find that all of the Yes interventions equivalently improve hope, um, perceived control, agency, self-hate. Um, and more recently, we actually were able to uh, complete a partnership with the City of San Antonio Metropolitan Health District to um, adapt and disseminate Project Yes for San Antonio teens in partnership with San Antonio teens as a citywide free resource. Um, so we were able to show that Project Yes was acceptable and feasible among San Antonio teens after incorporating all of their narratives and stories and perspectives into the interventions. Um, and also that it, it also resulted in uh, reductions in self-hate and hope uh, in both languages. Uh, the paper describing that is under review. Um, the preprint is available if you'd like to read more about it. We've also pursued a number of social media uh, partnerships. Um, in, in, in many cases, this has been in collaboration with an amazing nonprofit led by Rob Morris called COCO, which works with uh, social media companies to embed mental health supports into where people already are. 
Um, so our SSIs have actually been embedded into Tumblr and are still available to any Tumblr user as just-in-time mental health supports. Um, specifically, folks who search for things like therapy or depression or self-harm or suicide, um, if they're COCO users, get the option to try out our single session interventions. In an initial study, we both um, disseminated our SSIs to more than 6,100 teens within one year. Um, and we also reduced the length of our SSIs from 25 minutes to just six while retaining those best elements that I talked about earlier, because that's about how long a person will spend on something that they're not getting paid for in the context of a research study. But what we found was that hopelessness reduced at least as much in our Tumblr-based SSIs that lasted six minutes as in our RCTs of 25-minute SSIs. However, completion rates increased by 50% in this study compared to prior naturalist dissemination efforts that we had uh, pursued via social media. So this is really exciting. Often you see a voltage drop when you transport these interventions into real world settings. We are not seeing that here, at least in the short term, which is very exciting. And we're looking forward to exploring that in more detail. Another recent project that's now under review um, is can we use SSIs to increase crisis resource uptake? Social media platforms often have built-in algorithms to flag users as being in crisis. Um, so they often uh, receive text lines or hotlines automatically. You may have even seen them yourself. They may look something like this, a crisis text line, the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Unfortunately, many people in crisis do not use these resources, either because they don't think they will work, they don't feel like they're sufficiently personalized, or they just don't feel um, like they have the energy to follow through. So we wanted to see whether a social media embedded SSI could actually boost crisis resource uptake, not just impact mental health outcomes as the primary endpoint. So we created and tested whether a one minute enhanced crisis response SSI could beat out crisis response as usual, as in what Facebook and Discord and Tumblr already use for folks who identified as in crisis. The SSI included a one sentence psychoeducation statement about the fact that people aren't alone, a story from a peer who used the resources before, user choice to try hotlines, peer support, to support or self-help. So that empowerment element was built in as well. And we tested this out in Tumblr, Discord, Facebook, and Telegram in 355 people, both teens and adults. 80% of our sample was LGBTQ, um, and many were uh, gender diverse folks as well. We found that people in the enhanced crisis response SSI condition reported significant reductions in hopelessness from pre-intervention to 10 minutes after the intervention compared to crisis response as usual, which was associated with slight increases in hopelessness over 10 minutes. We also found that the, not the, the percentage of people who followed up and used a resource when presented with our SSIs was double approximately uh, the folks who use resources in the crisis response as usual. Um, so I'm really happy to report that there are efforts in progress um, to partner with social media companies to see if we can adopt at scale just a different approach, a very slightly different enhanced approach um, to encouraging people to seek help when they're in crisis and flagged on social media websites. Um, just last week, I was lucky to join Rob Morris in a meeting with Facebook Health and or Google Health, and we'll see where it goes from there. Um, so we also have many efforts in place to support patients on wait lists as a means of SSI dissemination. The wait list problem is universal and chronic and incredibly large. Um, I also noted, and this was evident in a lot of feedback that we've gotten in our digital SSIs, some people who are seeking care do want to talk to a human. Um, that is especially true for folks who are seeking outpatient mental health treatment, right, for a, for a therapist-delivered intervention. So it seemed appropriate in order to meet the expectations and preferences of people to have one option at least for a face-to-face -face or a provider-delivered single-session intervention. And that's how the SSC was born. Um, in this series of studies, we're trying to test whether a therapist-delivered solution-focused brief therapy SSI can reduce hopelessness, increase agency, and prevent symptoms from worsening in people on wait lists for therapy. It's a very simple intervention. When I first developed it, I was envisioning like college students providing it to their peers, not professionals providing it to patients. However, um, it turned out to be applicable and potentially relevant in many different settings. Um, so I'll, I'll share a little about, about our, our most recent trials uh, and what we've found. We've conducted a few at this point, but 
Um, recently, we looked at whether the SSC, when delivered via tele teletherapy during the pandemic, could accomplish these goals in waitlisted clients here at Stony Brook University, mostly young adults, but also including teens and older adults. We found that SSC clients showed an 85% chance of their hopelessness levels decreasing from pre to post program. Their readiness for change while they were waiting for treatment showed an 81% chance of increasing. They were all already pretty motivated for treatment as they had already sought out care, but even so, we saw that improvement. And we also saw decreases in anxiety and depression while they were waiting a couple of weeks later. Um, since increases in symptoms while waiting for care are the norm, this is, of course, really exciting to see. It's also consistent with the results that we've seen in other trials of the SSC. I give SSC trainings pretty regularly because the training is only 90 minutes, and then we can um, actually reliably have people uh, deliver it to fidelity, which we can measure because the intervention is just a worksheet. Um, the SSC is now being delivered to folks on wait lists in schools and youth centers and primary care and in emergency departments in at least seven U.S. states and five countries that I know of because that's where I have done trainings um, and folks have followed up and um, the, anecd the anecdote data has been very promising at least. Um, and we're currently piloting a self-guided SSC for folks who may prefer a digital format just to see how that goes. We also recently received funding from HRSA to create uh, a drop-in single session support center for healthcare workers. Um, this is something we're really excited about because it's a HRSA grant and as such, the focus is on resource dissemination, not necessarily on a rigorous RCT. We've already done the RCTs, so we're really happy to de dedicate more of our time to just disseminating and sharing what we've learned and providing resources to folks. So this S3 center, single session support drop-in center, is specifically aimed to serve healthcare workers and trainees here at Stony Brook who have very high needs, uh, particularly since the pandemic in terms of wellness and mental health. Um, we offer both online and face-to-face -face SSIs, including the single session consultation and adapted versions via stakeholder input and focus groups of our digital programs. The providers are nursing and clinical psych trainees, which makes it a sustainable uh, center after the grant period is over because um, serving as a clinician in the center can actually be a clinical rotation for both uh, kinds of trainees. And the services are free to healthcare workers and, and, and students, which we're really happy about as well. Okay, last study that I'll share with you, and then we can wrap up and hopefully I can answer a few questions. Um, this is a study that was has, has been a couple of years in the making and has been a wonderful collaboration with Catherine Fox's lab. Catherine Fox is an assistant professor at the University of Denver. Um, we received funding from the Upswing Fund for Adolescent Mental Health to adapt our lab single session interventions for and with LGBTQ teens. Um, the reason we pursued this was because we were seeing over and over in our trials that the samples that we're getting without really any effort seemed to be LGBTQ folks. Perhaps that's because we reduced the barrier of parent permission. Um, but in any case, that's who we seem to be reaching. So we wanted to make sure that our, our supports were really built for that population. What we learned from focus groups in that, in that um, project was that they didn't really, LGBTQ teens we talked to didn't really have that many suggestions for the existing SSIs, but they did note that none of our SSIs talk about context, the world, how difficult it is to be in a, in, in a country where discrimination against LGBTQ folks is so rampant and increasing, and how scary that can be and how it can impact mental health. So because of that feedback, we actually ended up creating a new intervention again with LGBTQ teens called Project RISE, Building Strength in the Face of Minority Stress, that teaches about what minority stress theory is, the fact that simply um, holding a minoritized identity and the, discri the discrimination and oppression that comes with that can make it much harder to deal with mental health difficulties and can exacerbate those problems. Um, and help people make an action plan for coping with minority stress, even um, though, you know, in a fair world, they wouldn't have to. Um, so a lot of validation and empowerment to cope in the face of distress. Our sample was 575 LGBTQ teens, ages 13 to uh, 16, again, recruited via Instagram and obtained uh, with a parent consent waiver. This is an example of an action card that Project RISE users end up with. They, are, um, they learn in moments of identity stress that they might think I am worth more when I'm successful and I accomplish things. They might feel shame but really they want to connect with people who accept them. And I can feel better by remembering this unfair treatment isn't a reflection on me. I'm still proud to be me. And they can use this in moments of minority stress. 
90% of youth who, project, who started Project RISE completed it, which is a really high completion rate for a self-guided internet-based activity. So that speaks to acceptability. Youth rated both conditions, because this was an RCT, is acceptable. The control was simply a worksheet providing basic information about what minority stress theory is. We thought that youth in both conditions would benefit from knowing about minority stress theory, so we wanted to make sure that uh, they were learning about it, while also ensuring that we were testing the utility of our intervention as a delivery system, so including the narratives and the writing exercises and the action card, could that be helpful? Folks in Project RISE condition compared to the control showed larger decreases in internalized stigma, increases in identity pride, declines in hopelessness and self-hate. And the RISE group decreases in internalized stigma persisted two weeks later, which was really exciting for us to see. I also want to note that every, every outcome improved in both conditions within group significantly from pre to two week follow up. So it also seems that simply sharing information about minority stress theory can be useful. Um, we recently then, um, based on a lot of the work that I've shared, submitted an R01, which is now pending review at NIMH, um, a nationwide trial of online SSIs for depression and sexual and gender minority youth, which is a comparative effectiveness trial, looking at project personality, project rise, and their combination in a sample of 6,000 LGBTQ teens with depression to see if either or both of these SSIs together uh, can synergistically reduce depression in LGBTQ teens. There's a lot of discussion um, in LGBTQ mental health research about how and to what degree um, are adaptations to evidence-based treatments necessary um, for reducing depression in this population. And this study will actually get at that question specifically in the context of evidence-based single session interventions. Um, so hopefully we'll get this funded and we'll be able to understand better, not just how these comparatively work both independently and synergistically, but also their short and longer term over two years outcomes uh, for youth in need. I'm gonna stop there, that is plenty. <laughs> um, thank you so much for your attention. This is a small subset of the many people who made this possible, the funding that made it possible, links to our open access interventions. Happy to take any questions that you all have. Thank you. That was amazing. Um, and we have a couple of questions that I had mentioned. Um, if you might trickle in more, I'm going to um, hit answer live so you could then um, see them. But the first question is um, excellent body of work. This might be not good. And thank you for sharing. Um, as parents of adolescents who may also empower their anxiety, have you thought of modifying Project Empower for parents of adolescents and combining it um, with an adolescent version um, to support brave behavior or any other mechanism? We are going as fast as we can. <laughs> yes, we've thought about it. It's a wonderful idea, and I'm happy that you've brought it up. Um, I'm really hopeful that sooner than later, other folks will be excited about this work beyond our lab and be able to extend this work in new directions. I think that's an awesome one, mm -hmm. and you should totally do that. Study. <laughs> I'm happy to talk to you about it. Um, the second question is, um, for Project in Power, was there any me objective measure of anxiety? So of child anxiety, yeah. Um, no, we didn't actually measure tri um, child anxiety. We first wanted to see if we could establish target engagement. Mm -hmm. um, so kind of the experimental therapeutics NIMH model. Yeah. Um, we assume we would not ever be able to target child anxiety if we weren't seeing those proximal reductions in accommodation and distress tolerance in parents because those are the mechanisms of change in theory. Um, so we're working on larger scale trials um, to see if we can then observe downstream preventive effects in child anxiety, but that wasn't what the first trial was aiming to do. Sure. Um, I want to note someone had raised their hand and I don't know admittedly how to undo the that. So if you're able to write your um, question in the um, chat, that would be or in the Q&A, that'd be terrific. Um, next question. Um, and I then keep looking around. Um, so I lose it. So I apologize. Do you, participant compensation? Um, no, but that's a good one. Go oh, for the, it. The, I, I see one in the Q&A. Cool. Yeah, go for I it. I want to address that because it's a really good question. Thank you. Yeah. Heather Risser for answering, for asking that. Um, so uh, yes, but not in all studies. Um, so uh, in the Tumblr and the social media partnerships, for example, nobody gets paid because that's just like routine in life, um, what we're able to, to deliver to people. Um, and 100% folks are more likely to in, complete something if they are paid to do it. Um, but in real world trials of digital um, self-help tools, we tend to see a 1 to 28% completion rate of these kinds of interventions. And in our trials, it's closer to 50. 
um, in, on, in unpaid versions. So very excited that we're able to at least increase that marker, but really good points. And our student, Katie Cohen, who used to be at Northwestern, led a great study looking at the specific effects of paying people versus not in SSI trials. Is that paper out? It is. It's an oh, internet good. interventions. It's really good. And you should read it. Way to go, Katie. <laughs> cool. Um, do you think LGBTQ um, youth may be more likely to be searching online for mental health support or interested in online or tech-based interventions that do not risk them um, from being further minoritized in a therapeutic session? hundred um, percent. And that's a big reason um, when we ask qualitatively, like what's gotten in the way of seeking out support, the lack of um, providers who they would feel safe with is definitely something that's been documented in the literature and that shows up a bit in our research as well. Um, so that's yet another reason that these self-guided supports can be particularly important to create for and with LGBTQ teens, for sure. Yeah. Um, I, I share this question from um, someone, Tali Ball, fantastic presentation and work. What do you think is the most promising or effective dissemination strategy out of those that you have investigated? So this is a qualified answer. So far in the four years that we've been doing this in our lab, social media by far has mm -hmm. been the most successful dissemination strategy. However, um, we haven't gotten into the weeds of how we can optimize implementation of primary care-based and school-based SSIs. Got it. I think those are really promising directions. However, they would, in, they would require a different level of institutional and infrastructural support mm -hmm. in order to actually stick. But if that were there, I can see those as extremely powerful means um, of disseminating these interventions. They just require a different and more extensive implementation setup. Mm -hmm. um, you had talked about restrictive eating and someone had asked, have you developed any SSI or SSC with eating disorders? Mm -hmm. So um, I gave a keynote at the Eating Disorder Research Society conference a couple of months ago, and I'm talking with like 10 people about this. Um, I hope that, that one will exist soon. Um, also, our amazing lab coordinator, uh, coordinator um, Ar Ariel Smith, has been working on an SSI for body neutrality. Mm -hmm. um, the idea that valuing your body based on what it can do for you, not how it looks, uh, can be uh, restorative <laughs> and super helpful. And she's found so far, I think we're, we're just analyzing the pilot data, but good effects for that. So, awesome. you know, stay tuned. Another amazing team member. So that's mm -hmm. a good shout out too. Uh, and thank you. That's exciting. Well, um, stay tuned for that. Um, have you thought about measuring hormone levels, especially cortisol levels, and compiling data to prove um, effectiveness, given the emphasis on teaching patients about it from a science-based perspective? I could see value in incorporating that element. So that's tough to do when we're recruiting people from all 50 states online. Yep. <laughs> However, in my dissertation study, I did actually uh, measure heart rate variability and electrodermal recovery rates after a true social stress test after our SSI, and we found that recovery rates from a, a distressing task were faster um, in the SSI group for project personality than in the active control group. So we've done that in one study. Um, it's just often not compatible with the methods we use for recruitment and dissemination. Um, so it could be really valuable, especially for kids who are excited about that science connection, mm -hmm. right? There's a lot of them, um, but it's not something that's been super feasible for us to do in a lot of our work lately. Yeah. And we have literally one minute left and you've been rapid fire. This is awesome. So the last question is, um, have you or will you, it sort of goes back to, every, you know, the train is moving so fast. Have you or will you also be expanding the study to non-LGBTQ focused populations? And what about um, targeting other types of minorities? Yeah, um, some of the folks in our lab are very, very interested in um, uh, modifying and adapting and optimizing SSIs using co-design methods for ethnically and racially minoritized populations of different varieties. Uh, Chantel Ralston, who's a first year PhD student in our lab, has an NSF award to specifically increase uptake of ethnically and um, racially minoritized folks into trials like the ones that we conduct um, and increase engagement among those folks. And um, I think a lot of people with a lot of perspectives and experiences are going to be needed to do that kind of work. Um, and as it expands and more people get into the fold of, of kind of uh, pursuing SSI research and seeing where it can go, I'm really excited for more to come out there and to be involved whoever I can. Um, again, great idea. We just haven't had time yet. <laughs> for sure. Uh, well, yeah, on that note, so you... Disability is also a great area. Thank you, commenter. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Um, thank you for all of this. We're at time. This was an incredible uh, presentation and um, body of work. We appreciate all that you shared. Um, so on behalf of CBITS, on behalf of the um, Society for Digital Mental Health, thank you, and we'll see you next month. Thanks so much.